Hello, this is Chris Helton of the Dorkland blog, and tonight I have uh, here on the Dorkland Roundtable Matt Forbeck. Say hello, Matt. Hi, Chris. How you doing? <laughs> and uh, we're, we we were we were commiserating about our relative colds, uh, cold temperatures uh, here in uh, uh, February. So yep, it. it uh, you're up in. You might be a uh, little warmer than me in general. A little warm, yeah. You, you're in Wisconsin, yeah. So, I think most of the time, just on on general principles, you're probably colder than it is in Florida. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's, latitude tends to do that too. Yeah. <laughs> That, that whole equator thing. Um, yeah, I have a theory, though. That's how games started in Wisconsin, how TSR started in Wisconsin, because it's too damn cold to do anything else around here all winter. <laughs> so, you know, you I don't... Go outside. Well, see, I grew up in Indiana. I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Midwesterner, and, you know, I grew up, I, I grew up in a small town um, in Indiana, and those winters there were just brutal. And, yeah. I mean, you could... You, you just... There were times... I, I can remember when I'd be stuck in the house for like a week or so because of a blizzard. I mean, the yep. it was the blizzard of '76. Uh, yep. We were stuck in we were stuck in our, our apartment for like two weeks, before, and the National Guard had to come out and, and dig us out with tanks and stuff. Wow. Yeah, it well, was. Here we know how to remove snow at least, right? We're used to it. we get a lot of snow, but we yeah. know how to deal with it. We have all. Well, the we just weren't expecting like it was something like. 14 feet, and it happened within like eight hours or something of insane like that. So it just, yeah, it was just more than anyone could handle. It was, it, it was. I never ever want to be in a in another uh, winter storm like that again. But, um, <coughs> as long as we're talking about uh, the past, um, let's talk about how you got your start in uh, gaming. What was your first game, and in, in you know about how old were you? Uh, let's you, see. You can, about, you can fudge that if you don't want people to no, know that's exactly okay. how old you are. I'm not ashamed of my age. I earned every one of those years <laughs> and the gray years to go with it. Um, my first role-playing game, I mean, my first games were when I was really young, right? Obviously playing chess or whatever, checkers. But my first role-playing game, my first hobby game was Dungeons & Dragons, and it was uh, the uh, it was basic d and in a... Uh, had a dragon on the cover with a, like a blue wash. It wasn't even uh, full color. And it was before Advanced Dungeons & Dragons had even come out originally, right? Um, or at least where we were. We couldn't find AD&D anywhere. And a friend of mine's mom had got it for him uh, for Christmas on a blue light special at Kmart, believe it or not. And uh, we ended up like going, oh, yeah, we should play this sometime. And then that summer we finally sat down and played it. And I was, I think, uh, nine going on ten at the time. And I just loved it, just fell in love with it and really haven't looked back since. Um, you know, I started playing that. I played all sorts of other TSR games. We uh, got into Chaosium games. We got into SPI and Avalon Hill and everything else we can get our hands on after that. Uh, started going to Gen Con and local conventions and uh, just never quit. <clears throat> I have to say, um, Gen Con would have um, originally been a local convention for you. Yeah, it was, actually. I mean, um, it wasn't the first convention I went to. I went to a Winter Fantasy in Lake Geneva uh, where I first met Gary Gygax way back when. Uh, back in, like, 1982, I think. And um, then we had one in Beloit, Wisconsin, where I grew up, too, at Beloit College, and I met Gary there again. And then I went to my first Gen Con, was Gen Con 15, which I think this will make, this year will be my 31st Gen Con in a row then, right, because I've been going since I was just a wee lad. Um, and I've been a guest of honor there for the last 10 years as well. I just, I love the show. It's one of the great things I get to do every year. Been bringing my family the last couple of years too, so we get to bring my wife and all the kids, uh, and it's crazy fun. Just too much going on. I, I get very little sleep, but I have a ball. Well, you're also one of the, as long as we're talking about uh, Gen Con now, um, you're also one of the organizers for the Diana Jones. Shindig. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Diana Jones Award is a group of uh, this shadowy cabal of people that meet online and pick out whatever we think was the coolest thing in gaming that year. And it's been going for, I think, 10 or 11 years now, maybe going on 12 now even. Um, and it was originally started by James Wallace, who had this trophy that uh, was originally a trivia trophy, believe it or not. But uh, what had happened is the guys from TSR UK had all been laid off at once. They closed the entire uh, UK branch of TSR, which were the original publishers of Dungeons & Dragons. And uh, they burned a copy of the Indiana Jones role-playing game. And all, the only parts of it that were left were the parts that said Diana Jones. Right? So they took that and encased it in a uh, plexiglass pyramid and put it on a wood base 
and made a trivia trophy out of it. And it somehow fell into Gene's hands. And he said, well, I have this trophy. We've got to do something with it. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. Uh, so he decided to do the Diana Jones Award, which has been going on ever since. Uh, and one of the big things we do for it is we have a ceremony or a party for it at Gen Con every year on the Wednesday before the show. And that's been going on for several years now. Um, started out at my birthday party one year at Gen Con, where I, <laughs> I hosted on a Saturday night. We had uh, Peter Atkinson won the award that year. Tracy Hickman showed up and got his Hall of Fame award from the Origins people as well. And uh, it went so well that we decided to make it an annual thing. So I just basically passed the hat around to a bunch of different uh, publishers and, and gamers uh, before the convention. And we end up with a couple thousand dollars worth of drink tickets that we hand out to people and uh, have a hell of a time. It's a great time. And I was to say, I've, I've been twice, and the drink tickets are appreciated. I can tell you <laughs> that. <laughs> well, you have to thank our sponsors. They do a hell of a job. I always <coughs> appreciate it. Uh, we never run short. It's always been amazing. Every year I'm going, oh, my God, it's never going to come through. And every year uh, everybody just pitches in just enough to bring it up past where we need it, and we have a great time. Now, um, how, how did you make your your transition from being a, a you know gamer doing all the stuff to being sort of the, the fledgling game designer? And Well, I, uh, I started out when I was in high school. I knew that I wanted to be a writer. And I was already fiddling with games, so I started a uh, a fanzine, is what you would call it nowadays. We thought it was a magazine at the time, uh, called the Quill and Scroll, which was when I was 16 years old. We started this up, and when I was 16, I had my first booth at Gen Con, believe it or not, right? Um, and it was uh, a general purpose gaming magazine, and it had different articles that could be used with different uh, types of games, different role playing games mostly. And we did interviews of different people. I interviewed uh, Dieter Sturm over uh, TSR. And Dr. Thomas Rudecki once, who was the guy who was against, uh, who was leading leading psychologist against games at the time. So, um, and I that, that uh, brought me into the, doing that kind of stuff professionally. I was to say, I bet that must have been an interesting um, interview talking with uh, <laughs> someone someone like that. I mean, it was what, interesting considering you know I was, I was 16 at the time, and I'm just calling up from my house saying, "Hey, I'd like to interview for my magazine." And, you know, <laughs> And this is all before the internet, whatever. So yeah. I'm getting long distance charges, and um, or my father was at the time, I guess. <laughs> yeah, te yeah. Technically, that was probably him paying that. Now, I, so. I mean, what what sort of what sort of things did you ask him? And you know, what what what, what did he think when when you know you told him you were a gaming magazine? Well, you know, I, I think uh, he we actually got along fairly well on the phone. He was pretty pleasant. Uh, I just read recently that he's been picked up and uh, he's lost his license for. Uh, I think it was sexual relations with some of his patients, right? Yeah. He's giving out bad prescriptions that he shouldn't have been, things like that. Um, so I think he discredited himself over the years in a yeah. number of different ways, unfortunately for him. Um, but, you know, his research never held water, honestly. It was mostly just opinion, and it was pretty much like the thing we have nowadays where people are attacking video games for being yeah. responsible for violence, right? <coughs> you know, sure, there, there might be some kind of link between heightened aggression and playing a lot of video games, but whether or not, just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's causation, right? Right. Um, and it certainly doesn't cause people to go out and kill people. Otherwise, you know, um, you'd think we see a lot more killings nowadays than we do. <laughs> but anyhow, that's that's an entirely yeah. separate issue. But uh, Radecki was, you know, he was actually a pleasant interview. And again, I was 16 years old, and I was as courteous as I could be to the guy. Um, but you know, part of that's when you're 16, you don't know any better, right? It's not right. like you're going to set them down and you know, suddenly start drilling them for the hard questions. Um, but you ask questions like, you know, what do you think about this? What, do you really think that's true? And he, he tries to answer. And, um, I thought it was a nice, controversial topic, and it was something that I wanted to be able to explain to my parents when they had questions about this kind of stuff, and especially to my friends' parents. My, my parents had always been very supportive of me doing this kind of thing. Um, but sometimes my friends' parents weren't always the same about it, so it was uh, a good opportunity for me to be able to say, let's have this open discussion and, and have the dialogue and see if we can poke holes in what this guy is saying um, so we know what we are up against when we have to deal with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I remember my dad made me sit down and watch the big uh, 60 Minutes expose on D&D, yeah. &D, the one where they interviewed Gary, and I made the mistake. It was It was just a terrible, terrible... Piece. I, I don't know if you saw it back at the time, but yeah. I remember they, they had it had to have been staged, but it was like this this reenactment of a D and D session and these people in costumes, and it was like watching this low budget movie. And um, my my dad had asked me some question about like you know 
is that the sort of thing that, that goes on in your games or something like that? And, and I made the mistake of going, um, no, actually, that looks a hell of a lot more interesting than the stuff we do. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just sit around with bag with you know bowls of potato chips and stuff, and man, they've got like you know props. <laughs> I didn't thought of this until now, Dad. But Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, um, you you found yourself in sort of a, a publishing position fairly early on in your uh, you know at this point we'll just yeah. use the kind of quotes uh, professional career as a. I, I mean, I was publishing myself essentially, me and my friends. And then uh, I went off to college, and that kind of all fell away, and I didn't do it anymore. And I got involved with uh, a guy named Will Niebling, who was the first sales representative for uh, for TSR, actually, first sales guy, for, director for TSR. And uh, Will had gone to the University of Michigan, and I was going there, and Troy Denning put us together, actually. Troy was a friend of mine. I had been playtesting games for Paysetter games back when I was in high school. And Paysetter was a, a group of people who had then game designers at TSR who had then gone off and formed their own company after that, right? And they did games like uh, Chill was the big one. Uh, Chill was Master a fun was game. I love Chill. Tracks. Yeah, great stuff, right? Um, but Troy had introduced me. Troy's writing Star Wars novels nowadays, so he's doing all right for himself. But Troy introduced me to Will, and I ended up doing uh, uh, inventory for Will at Greenfield Hobby Distributors, and then Will would take me around to different conventions around the country, too. I'd stand in the booths with the Iron Crown guys and the Grenadier guys and the Coplow Games guys and um, uh, Mayfair Games guys. And, you know, we'd just chat and talk, and I'd say, well, hey, you need some game designers. I could probably help you out with that. And, uh, eventually wormed my way into it that way and started doing uh, professional game design when I was in college. And then when I got out, I, worked, I had a student work visa, and I went to go work for Games Workshop for six months in Nottingham, actually. Um, in a crazy, wild coincidence, because I, I didn't have a job with them when I went to England. I just had a student work visa to go to England because I wanted to go to Europe. And I called them up and said, hey, I saw Adam White Dwarf like six months ago. Do you still have an opening? And they said, yeah, sure, come on in. And I ended up landing the job. I mean, I flew over to England with $600 in my pocket on a one-week ticket my dad had gotten me for my graduation present because <laughs> uh, we didn't know when I was going to be coming back. And I landed the job, and I was there for six months, and they, uh, they offered me a full-time permanent job, um, but I wanted to come back to be with my girlfriend, so that's what I did instead. Um, that's now my wife and the mother of my five children, so it worked out all right for me. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> now, what sort of things did you do at Game, Games Workshop? Uh, I started out working on White Dwarf, and I edited a bunch of, edited a bunch of articles for that. I also uh, edited and developed and designed the first two supplements for uh, Space Hulk which were Deathwing and Gene Stealer, uh, which is still one of my favorite games of all time. And I worked on the Blood Bowl Players Companion, too, back then for Games Workshop. I started a little bit while I was there and then worked on it as a freelance project after I left the company, um, which is ironic because then, you know, I can't tell you even how many years later, maybe 15 years later, I came back and started writing um, uh, Blood Bowl novels for Games Workshop and ended up doing blood, four Blood Bowl novels and five Blood Bowl comic books for them over the years. Sort of, oh, a, yeah. <laughs> um, now, w uh, w when you got the, those writing gigs, did people know of your work on the, the original stuff in the first place? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the reason I got offered the, uh, well, I mean, when I started working with the Black Library, it was uh, Mark Gascon was the name of the guy who was running it at that time, and Lindsay Priestley was the second in command. Um, and Lindsay I had known from working in Games Workshop back you know, in 1990 or so. Um, and Mark I had met in bars and had drinks with him. He hadn't been working with the company at the time. He was in a hiatus where he'd been laid off from the company, but eventually got hired back by them. Um, and I, had, I kept up contact with Mark over the years and with Lindsay. So when Mark was running the company, he asked me to pitch him a whole bunch of ideas for novels. And I sent him, a, like, you know, 12 different ideas on three pages and said, you know, what do you think? And he said, uh, we like this one. And he picked up Blood Bowl. <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? I had, like, you know, the space marines and the space orcs and the Eldar and whatever else going around over here. And then he picks up the Blood Bowl one, which I had kind of thrown it as a joke. Um, they said, yeah, nobody else has pitched Blood Bowl novels, so we'd like to give it a try. And I said, okay, what the hell? And I wrote up a uh, full, fuller pitch for it, a couple pages, three pages, whatever it was. And they said, sure, let's go. So they uh, sent me a contract, and I went off and wrote three novels for them on the first contract and then wrote a fourth after that because they sold all of them. Now, um, 
sort of sort of jumping around a bit. Um, how did you um, how did you end up uh, with Pinnacle and the whole uh, Brave New World thing? Well, Pinnacle, uh, Shane Hensley and I were good buddies before Pinnacle, before Pinnacle started. Uh, he and I were both freelancers at about the same time. And so we'd go to conventions and we'd drink beers with each other and hang out and play games and, and whatever else. And uh, when he came up with Deadlands, he wanted to start a company. He, hired, he uh, flew me and Greg Gordon down to see him in Virginia. And uh, Greg was not, unable to continue with the company for various reasons. Um, but I was. And I said, hey, you know, if I'm going to be this involved in it, I'd like to actually own a part of the company. So I bought into the company and became the president, and Shane was the CEO and, and co-founder. And uh, we worked together. I ended up moving down to Virginia eventually. We worked there for four years, I think. Um, and then at the end of that time, I uh, was about the time when Brave New World came out. And my, uh, just before that, uh, my wife had gotten pregnant, and we decided that we wanted to move back to Wisconsin uh, when the baby was born. Uh, so we did that because we wanted to be near grandparents, which is essentially, you know, free babies. Very handy, yeah. <laughs> um, so I ended up doing that, and then when Pinnacle broke up shortly after that, just the, the long distance thing wasn't working out too well, um, Shane ended up taking Deadlands uh, in his part of the company. I ended up taking Brave New World in my part of the company. And I turned around and sold Brave New World to Alderac, who had been partnered with us at, at uh, Pinnacle at the time as well. And uh, they treated me pretty well. They hired me on and gave me a job for a year and uh, uh, published six books for the game under, under that umbrella. And after that year was up, we said, okay, well, it's not selling well enough, so you go do your own thing. And I ended up wandering off and doing more games and novels, essentially, since then. And computer yeah. games, too, I guess. <laughs> um, as I say, because um, I'm, I'm a big um, you know, comic and, and uh, superhero role-playing game fan, uh -huh. but... For some weird reason, and I'm not sure how this ended up happening, one of one of the I think glaring holes in my um, collection in that regard or experience was with Brave New World. That was one game for some reason, and I think it was just because of you know that sort of pre-internet time when you just didn't know what the hell where you know where games were yeah. or how to find it things. It was early days for sure. Now, now, what what led to the, the the creation of Brave New World? I mean, what what kind of things were inspiring you back then well, to, I'd to create it? Well, I'd always been a superhero fan from when I was a kid, right? Um, and I'd played a lot of DC heroes and Marvel superheroes over the years and champions. Um, I had my first big uh, writing gig in the industry that I wrote my own book was uh, Western Hero, actually. So it was a Western version of Champions, essentially, for Iron Crown back in the day. And Monty Cook ended up being my editor on that one, believe it or not. So. That was uh, one of his first gigs when he first uh, got hired on by Aaron Crown back in the day. And, um, you know, I just kind of kept up with it. I also, one of the things I'd done before Pinnacle was I had co-designed the Wildstorms collectible card game with a guy named Drew Bittner and, and with Jim Lee, obviously, who was at uh, Wildstorms at the time. Jim was the owner of Wildstorms. Now he's the co-publisher of DC Comics. Um, and they hired me in to help them out with the game design. And so that was a, uh, something else where I was really wedded into comics. I've been reading them for you know decades at that point. Um, and I knew that, and Shane had also encouraged us. He said, you know, when you get down to doing this, it's going to be a superhero game, I'm sure. And so it was. But, I mean, Brave New World is also not just a superhero game. It's this dystopian setting where uh, superheroes have been outlawed unless you're working for the government. And so uh, it, had a lot, it had a lot of politics involved in it, too. And it was all based upon this horrible terrorist attack upon Chicago that had destroyed it. And this is all pre-9-11 by a couple of years. Um, so it was um, interesting to see all that kind of stuff play out where you've been predicting all these horrible things that would happen after some kind of a disaster like that play out in real time um, after a real-life disaster. So it, it makes you a little uncomfortable, to be honest. I don't know if we could have been able to come up with... I don't think we could have been able to publish Brave New World as a role-playing game with a burning American flag on the cover <laughs> in yeah. 2002, right? It came out in 1999, and then it was perfectly fine. But 2002, it would have been too raw of a wound for us yeah. to actually go that close to it, right? Yeah, it was interesting because when I, I talked to uh, Wolfgang uh, Bauer for one of these, yeah. and uh, one of the things that we talked about was um, the, um, the freelancers' books for uh, Top Secret. And we were talking about just the, the, the elements of the... Um, of the story, because that was also another, you know, in the future and dystopian future thing. He goes, it, we were talking about some of the things that, that seemed so silly at the time that ended up being like, you know, 
oh my god, people actually want to do this in the future. Like, exactly. you know, the, the the plot element about wanting to build a wall around the United States, and <laughs> you, you, you know, you, you come think up with that stuff idea. is ludicrous when yeah. you write it, right? You hope yeah. it's ludicrous, and then it turns out that somebody is uh, thinks, you yeah, know, that's not a bad idea after all. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> It's, but, you know, if you write enough stuff, eventually things come true. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now, um, while we're on the, the, the Brave New World topic, um, you also did, um, I'm sure a lot of people watching this will know, but you had uh, your um, novel Kickstarter, Kickstarter yeah. for novels. And uh, you worked a couple of Brave New World novels, a trilogy, wasn't it, yes. into that? Yeah, I did this thing last year called 12 for 12, which was a uh, the idea that I could try to write a novel every month. I didn't end up quite writing a novel every month. I ended up writing about 10 of them, um, which is still pretty good. One of them ended up being a leverage novel for the TV show, uh, which kind of threw me off track a little bit. It was a little bit longer. It took a little bit more uh, back and forth with an editor uh, because of the license and everything. But still, I really enjoyed working on the book. <clears throat> and I also wrote nine comic books for Magic the Gathering last year, which took up a lot of time. Um, but... Uh, to fund the novels, I ran four different Kickstarters. I broke the 12 novels up into, into uh, four trilogies and ran a Kickstarter for each. And the first of those was based on Brave New World, which I basically went back to AG and said, hey, I'd like to do this. Can you guys give me a license to write these books? And they said, sure, go ahead, have fun. Um, and I did that, and they came out last summer, and they did pretty well. In fact, I'm selling them, selling the e-books for half off on my website right now. Go buy them. <laughs> uh, <coughs> But yeah, that was a, a chance for me to get back to a world that I hadn't touched for about a decade um, as far as doing some deep uh, storytelling like that. And that was a lot of fun. We also have a, we had a movie in the works for it uh, with the guys at Reactor 88 Studios licensed uh, or optioned out a film for it and then produced a like a three or four minute trailer kind of to give people an idea about what we wanted to do with it. And they've been searching for money ever since then to try to do a bigger budget film. In the meantime, they're doing smaller budget films. Um, we just I, I, I co-wrote uh, a film for Inspectors, which is Jared Sorensen's role-playing game of uh, slacker Ghostbusters, as we like to say. Uh, and we did a movie based on that, and it's in post right now. They're actually hoping to be able to release it sometime this summer or fall. Um, so what was it like uh, kind of going back to that setting after, you know, all the time had passed? Was it, was it, was it weird? Or? <laughs> it was very trippy. For one, by the time... I wrote it, it was all very contemporary. It was in 1999, right? Um, and then, you know, I come back to it in 2012, and I'm like, do I want to update it 10 years, 12 years, or, or 13 years, or do I want to just go back to it? So I actually left it in 1999 and said, okay, this is what was happening then, and we're going to tell the story, and we're going to tell a few extra stories added on to that for the book two and three of the trilogy. Um, but I didn't try to update that. I just kept it frozen in that moment in time in 1999. For one, the world has changed so much since I wrote that, right? Um, and I would not write the same kind of thing now if I said it in 2012. It would be something entirely different. Um, so I kept it in, in 1999. And, but it was a lot of fun to go back to. It was interesting. It was very different for me to be able to, to revisit those characters. And, you know, when I'm writing stuff in a role-playing game, you're writing characters in situations but you're not dealing so much with plots and emotions and, and uh, we are there's some plots and some emotions. But you're not dealing with you know a small set of characters and how they interact with each other. You're giving other people the tools to create their own stories, right? So it's neat for me to be able to say, okay, this is what I think is the official story for what happened here, and you know whatever you guys want to make of it. At least I hope I'm entertaining you at the same time. So I had a lot of fun working. It, it was kind of like going back to myself 13 years ago. <laughs> and. Uh... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I warned you about losing voices as we as we do this. Um, okay. <coughs> um, what was I gonna say? Oh, um, so in the um, in the other the other Kickstarters, uh, how many of the the twelve novels did you end up? Um, did you get all of the the sets of trilogies funded? Yeah, they all funded. They all overfunded. Actually, I should have I should have paid better attention. I no, know. that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the challenge of doing this kind of stuff. Is that you have to tell everybody these things. Sometimes you have to tell people things three or four times before, like, oh yeah, that, I remember that. You know? um, and while it's a big thing in my life, I don't expect it to be a big thing in anybody else's life, right? Um, but yeah, I ran four different Kickstarters. They all overfunded. Um, the second one was for a setting called Shotguns and Sorcery which is uh, this fantasy setting, uh, kind of a fantasy noir thing, where uh, there's a large mountain called the Dragon Empire, on which sits 
on top of which sits a dragon, and uh, it's surrounded by a wall that protects the people inside of it from uh, the ravening hordes of undead that are trying to kill them from outside, right? And yeah, these people have basically given themselves up to the dragon in order to say, protect us while we build the wall so that we don't all die together, right? <laughs> um, but it's it's got a very Chandler-esque, noirish feel to it, as well as the Tolkien-esque fantasy in it as well. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. I, I put a short story called uh, Goblin Town Justice up on my website for free. People can go get that. And just this week, we're releasing the first book in it for the public. It went out to the backers already. And book two went out to the backers just last week as well. Um, and book three, I'm in the middle of revising right now. That'll be out shortly. Um, and then after that, we I moved on to a series called Dangerous Games, which is a set of uh, trilogy of thrillers set at Gen Con, actually. So I uh, I wrote the folks at Gen Con who are good buddies of mine and said, would you guys mind if I, you know, kill people at your convention? <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 go have fun. You know, we'll be the villains. We don't care. And <laughs> uh, they're really game for it. It was awesome. Uh, and you know, they're just such great people, honestly. I mean, Peter Atkinson over there and Adrian Swartout, uh, you know, Having Peter own Gen Con is like having Santa Claus own Christmas, right? It's just the right thing. It just makes so much sense. So, um, and they do such a great job over there. The whole team of people, Owen Seiler and CJ, and etc. I'll leave off people by keep naming Derek, etc. Uh, and and then you'll get and then you'll get hate mail. Then I'll get hate mail. But you know, what I'm saying is they're all <laughs> fantastic people. Yeah. They always take great care of me when I go to the shows, and I just love the the event. It's my favorite time of year, bar none, right? The only possible exception is waking up on Christmas morning with my kids. <laughs> so, um, and now my kids come to Gen Con, so I get it all. It's good. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, was the last Gen Con I was at two years ago. I I, I got to meet your kids. Uh, yeah, well, that's, did they swarm is, you? <laughs> uh, no, no. I've I've dealt with children, so I, I know how. To, you know, you, you don't make eye contact, and you know, oh wait, you no, that's, that's alligators. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're good fun. They're they're yeah. very energetic. They're young, but they're good fun. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so we did the uh, the Dangerous Games trilogy, and that went over fun too. That was actually the one that did best. Um, and I got to write a whole trilogy of stories, and that was a lot of fun. And then the last one was called Monster Academy, which is actually a young adult trilogy. I'm in the middle of writing the second book right now, and uh, that is a story of a young red dragon who has been kidnapped as an egg from uh, uh, from the kingdom and is then rescued and brought back to the righteous kingdom where the where good has triumphed over evil. And, but they've decided that they shouldn't kill all the monsters just because they're monsters. They have to wait for them to do something bad. So in the meantime, they're set in what's essentially a juvenile hall for monsters, <laughs> for young monsters. So there's uh, he lives in this place called Monster Academy where he's with you know a vampire and a werewolf and a, a set of... Uh, Gob, uh, hobgoblins and goblins and trolls and orcs and all sorts of other fun fantasy monsters. But they're all young kids, in a sense, that are stuck in this place living with each other and realizing that if they screw up their choices, are expulsion means either banishment or execution. Right? So, uh, there's some high stakes going on there for them. But it's a lot of fun, too. It's a, it's a series I'm really enjoying writing. Now, what have what have been the the challenges uh, uh, behind... Because I'm sure that, uh, you know, well, you, you know, because you, you've been doing this... Uh, the novel stuff for a while, but I'm sure, you know, trying to do 12 in, in 12 months, things popped up that you weren't really expecting. Yeah, I mean, the writing itself wasn't all that hard, to be honest with you. If, if all I had to do was sit down and write the books, I could easily write a dozen novels in a, in a year, right? Uh, but they were shorter novels. They were 50,000-word novels, which is a little bit shorter. That made it easier. But uh, on top of doing my other freelance gigs, um, uh, where I was writing some short stories. I was pitching other novels to major publishers. I was doing the comic books. Uh, on top of all that... It turns out that doing the book production itself takes a lot of time, which I knew, but it still, I was, doing ebooks was a new thing for me, right? I had done a lot of publishing when I was president of Pinnacle for four years. We, we published uh, scores of books, really. Uh, but, you know, doing ebooks is something different. I didn't have a staff with me to help me out. And also, the other thing that really sucked up a lot of time that I didn't realize was running the Kickstarters, right? The Kickstarter will suck up every spare second oh, yeah. of your life for the moments that it's on, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that. To tell people about it, it's incredible. Yeah, you, you're just kind of sitting there at, at your computer and, you know, refreshing and going, okay, now what? And now what? Yeah, and it's exactly. like, you get that initial surge usually of people are jumping or your fans are like, yeah, we're going. And then uh, 
And then it plateaus for a while. And during the plateau, you're sitting there going, oh, God, oh, my God, are we going to fund? And how do I get this to go? And who do I have to talk to? And how can I get in a blog? And how can I do interviews with people uh, and get some attention for this? And uh, it just drives you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> it, but it, it's, it's a wonderful, fun time. It's very uh, adrenaline packed. The neat thing about it is that you realize it's not going to go on forever, right? You only have the 30 days or whatever you set for yourself to actually uh, pump this thing. But it's, uh, but it's crazy, crazy uh, interactive, and it's crazy energetic for that period of time that you're doing it. Because you know it's going to end. You know that you, this is your chance. If you blow it, you're done. You have to you know, say, oh, geez, I failed, and go back to the drawing board. You know, there are worse things to happen to you. It's not like it's, uh, it's do or die. But um, you want these things to succeed. You put a lot of time and effort in them. You have people putting money into them, and you don't want to disappoint them. You want them to get the things they want uh, from you. So it... Every second you're not actually dedicating yourself to work or family, you're thinking, geez, what else could I be doing to make this thing take off? And, you know, I, I'm probably going to start another one here in a, few, in a couple weeks, and I'm already prepping for it, going, okay, i got to get ready for this. i got to clear the decks and make sure I don't have anything else that's killing me at the moment. Because um, I might end up, I have a possibility of going overseas to work on a computer game the next few weeks, and I don't want to do that the same time I'm doing this, because I don't think I could juggle both of those at the same time. Now, um, ha having run these, um, if you could give advice to uh, people who are looking to do this themselves, what's, what sort of uh, tips would you give to, to someone doing their, you know, like their first Kickstarter? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of advice. <laughs> um, actually, one, one thing I'm going to be doing is writing up my whole experience about this after I finish the last novel, so I'll have that available for people then. But in the meantime, I would say... Um, you know, make sure you get your costs correct so that you're not going to lose your shirt if you fund, right? And sometimes people think the worst thing can happen is that you're going to fail, right? Actually, the worst thing can happen is that you, you fund just enough to succeed and then realize that you didn't make enough money to cover all the costs that you actually incurred, right? Because uh, you don't want to run out of money. You, wanted, you don't want to disappoint people. Um, set aside every second you have that you possibly can for this because it's going to take, it's going to eat up your life that month or whatever you're running for. Uh, study every other successful venture that you can. Figure out what to do if it goes well. Figure out what to do if it starts to look bad. Figure out what to do if it goes really well, right? Because sometimes it's not even the uh, the Kickstarters that have had the most problems over the years aren't the ones that just that kind of do pretty well, but the ones that just blow everything out of the water, right? Because suddenly instead of doing like maybe a thousand items for people, you're doing Ten or twenty or fifty thousand items for people, and that becomes an order of magnitude more problems for you as far as fulfillment and print costs and all sorts of other problems you're going to encounter. So there's just a lot of pre-planning is the best. Do the most pre-planning you can. Ask lots of questions. Most of us are willing to help out because we're all learning this on the fly. Kickstarter is still fairly new territory for most people, most creators, even the guys who have done it. I've done four of them now, and it's still new territory for me, and I'm still learning new things. Uh, but just ask questions, get out there, have fun, uh, shoot low, as low as you can for your initial goals, and then aim as high as you can to get as, and push it as high as you can after that. But don't shoot so low you shoot yourself. That's always right. the key thing. Now, if you could go back um, to, uh, to Matt, you know, a month or two before you started your first Kickstarter, right. what, would you, what would you tell him to do differently? Get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, that's one of the things. I don't sleep a whole lot anyway. The kids destroyed my sleep schedule many years ago. Uh, but I, it's it's tough to be able to maintain this kind of a pace for what you're doing because you, you need to be always on when you're doing this kind of stuff, right? It's You need to be available to people to answer questions. If it goes really well, you have to be on a lot, right? You have to be online a lot. You have to be doing interviews a lot. You're going to have to be answering questions and you know, uh, dealing with problems as much as any other business person is going to have to do, right? Um, so be prepared for that. But there's, I would try to tell them, you know, it's going to work out. If I could tell myself it was going to work out ahead of time, that would take a lot of stress out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the second one I did, I did a major change between the second and the third one because the second when I did the first one, I thought, okay, I'm going to do a trilogy. What I'll do is I'll set the initial goal for the first book low, and I'll set the goal for the other books as stretch goals, right? And I'll try to make these so that they're not dependent upon each other, so if I don't quite make it all the way to the top, it's okay, right? But, of course, everybody wants all three books. That's the trick. Um, and the first one overfunded very easily, so it was not an issue. 
But the second one was a, a new idea for a setting that nobody had ever seen before, really, uh, as opposed to Brave New World, which had a fan base from 10 years before, right? And um, because of that, I think it was a harder sell out the gate. And when people looked at it, they're like, well, I want to give you all the money for all three books, but I'm afraid what's going to happen here is that I'm not, I'm going to give you all this money, and I'm only going to get one book. And so I think people held back a lot because of that, right? Um, and it, it, going into the last day, I was like, you know, four or $5,000 shy of where I needed to be to get all three books. And I was like, oh, damn it, this is not going to happen. Um, and I pushed as hard as I possibly could on every Internet venue I, I could find. And uh, I was very fortunate that we had uh, Will Wheaton and Neil Gaiman and John Rogers and a few other people with very prominent followings uh, retweet that for me on that final day and push people toward it. And we ended up raking in, I think, somewhere between seven and $8,000 that day, which put us over not only what we needed, but even more, right? Um, and I was very grateful to those guys for their help. It was incredible to be able to, uh, to get that kind of assistance when I really needed it. And so for the third one, what I did is I said, okay, screw this. We're not going to get you guys in a situation where you feel like you have to hold back or hesitate to join in. We're going to set the goal for all three books at a higher level, at $10,000 as opposed to $3,000 for one book. And we're going to go for this. And if we get past that, then we'll put up n different new stretch goals. So uh, we're all in here. It's either going to work or it's not going to work for the basic stuff. And don't worry about whether or not you can get all, the whole story. You're going to get the whole story, right? And that took a lot of the, uh, the doubt out of people's minds, I think. And the third one really was the best one I did. It overfunded by quite a bit. Uh, instead of 10000 I think we ended up making 18000 at the time. So it was... Uh, and every one of these, when I did them, uh, it wound up being in the top ten Kickstarter for fiction at, the, at that time. So since then, some of them have been booted down by other projects, obviously. But at the moment, every one of them was in the top ten, so I was really happy about that. I don't think um, the, the fiction Kickstarter, I mean, I, I haven't followed them as, as closely, but uh, have fiction Kickstarters really taken off quite like it has in other... You know, not to the same extent you see for... Uh, for games, for instance, right? I mean, some of the games ones have, have uh, had millions of dollars, literally, right? Yeah. Um, my buddy Mike Selinker, right now, hey, folks, right now is doing a uh, puzzle novel for Kickstarter, which kind of falls under novel, but kind of not, because it's its own, its own hybrid thing, right? But he's doing a puzzle novel called The Maze of Games, and it just cracked $100,000 over the weekend, right? And it still has, like three or four weeks to go. So I, I actually think Mike could crack 200, maybe 250,000 on this thing, which would be fantastic. And the neat thing about it, it's a neat uh, idea for a book where every spread, every two pages of the book has a puzzle on it, and you have to solve the puzzle to move to the next part of the book, right? And you think, oh, what the hell, I'll just skip ahead, right? No big deal. But the thing is that Mike put the pages in the book out of order. <laughs> so you don't know where to go. <laughs> Uh, and Mike is one of the great puzzle masters of all time. He really is. He's uh, uh, he runs Wired's Decode blog, and or not runs it, but is one of the major contributors for that. Um, and he does all sorts of different puzzles for all sorts of different magazines and newspapers and whatever. He runs the, uh, this great puzzle competition at Gen Con and at Origins every year, and uh, is fantastically talented and smart about it. So I backed it right away. I wrote an article about it for Wired's Geek Dad blog as well. Um, and you know so. Things like that, those hybrid kind of projects seem to be doing better, I think mainly because uh, they're a higher value proposition than just a book, right? You might think, oh, hey, you know, spending 40 bucks on a book like that makes perfect sense, whereas, you know, if I want to buy a paperback or an ebook, I'll expect to spend, you know, five or ten bucks. Right. So just because of the amount of money that goes in them, you figure it's going to be different. Like a lot of times these games that, that hyper fun um, are, you know, $100 games to start out with, right? And they get better and better as they hit more and more stretch goals. So you're like, oh, man, 100 bucks is nothing for all the stuff you get here. Like the Reaper one was fantastic for that. Um, but books, it's hard to do that with. I think the best book Kickstarter I've seen so far that was just pure book Kickstarter was uh, the Evil Hat one that Fred Hicks did with Chuck Wendig and Stephen Blackmore and Harry Conley, et cetera, um, and Katie Murphy. But the thing was that you know, what, what uh, Fred did is he said, he wasn't just one writer. He was a publisher, right? He's like, we're going to do this book, and if it funds, we're going to give you another book for the same price. And if it funds, we're going to give you another book for the same price. It ended up, at the end of the day, you could get, like, I think for 10 bucks, you get seven novels, right? And which is a staggering deal. You're like, yeah. oh, great. Um, and no complaints at all. I think it's, it ended up being about $42,000 or something like that. 
Uh, but if you look at some of the other Kickstarters for fiction, you'll see that they're suspiciously close to funding exactly on the nose, right? Yeah. And have a very small number of backers. So it's like, ah, somebody came in at the last second and rescued your ass, whether it was your friend, your buddy, you did it yourself. I don't know what happened. But those don't seem to me to be legitimate uh, Kickstarters in the sense that they were funded by people you don't know or friends or whatever, or fans coming in and pitching in a little bit. It was funded by a small number of people who were pitching in exactly enough to make yeah. sure. Right. Yeah, and I've noticed, <coughs> and you know, I'm not going to name any names on this, but right. I've noticed a few fiction Kickstarters where the authors seem to have a bit of bitterness involved in having to, like, you know, actually do this stuff themselves, and, you know, yeah. the publishers aren't interested in them anymore, and it's well, like... That's, not, that's never a great sales proposition, right? No, it's no, like, it... it hey, Everybody turned me down because they think I suck. So I'm gonna I'm forced to come to you people to beg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I saw one just like that a few months ago, and it was it was really sad because it was an author that I've always really liked. Some uh, someone who in the um, in the 80s and 90s sold really big. Right. And it was like um, pu n nobody wanted to touch this uh, new novel in in the same setting, and it was like. I know and I read, <laughs> I read the I read the Kickstarter, and I was just like, well, you know, looking at the way you're talking about things in this Kickstarter, I can understand why no publishers wanted to touch you. It, right. As I recall, they're asking for a whole lot of money too, which is not a great way to start out your first Kickstarter, right? Um, I mean, if you're going to do a Kickstarter, you need to. Uh, some people never even bother to do the basic research to figure out roughly how much money they might be able to pull in, and whether or not they can do that. Right? They say. Well, I need forty thousand dollars for this. I'm like, well, let's go back and check. If you get forty thousand dollars, that would put you in the top five Kickstarters in this category of all time, right? Given what you have here, do you think that's a realistic proposition? And it's very rare that somebody can pull that off their first time out. Um, one of the few exceptions I remember was when the gamers did their Hands of Fate Kickstarter for their film, right? For the Gamers Three Hands of Fate, they actually their goal was was guaranteed to make them in the top. Three, I think, for uh, for films of all time at that point, right? Which was pretty staggering. But they'd already run another Kickstarter before that for their Journey Quest stuff, so they knew roughly how many backers they could expect to have. They knew how to how to do all the publicity for this. They knew how to get their fan base motivated, and they actually had done all the research ahead of time, right? So I was pretty confident they were able to make, and they actually overfunded, believe it or not. So. Uh, but most people, when they come in, if they come in and they say, well, I need this much money, they're not thinking, okay, just because you need that much money doesn't mean you're going to get that much money. Right? Yeah. You need to think, what are, what's a realistic expectation for what I get from this Kickstarter? If, it doesn't, if it's not enough money, then don't start. Right? Yeah. I mean, you, you go back and say, well, okay, obviously that's not going to work. Maybe I should try something else. Right? Yeah. But don't step up and say, well, I need $25,000 or whatever it is. And, and uh you know, most of these end up funding in about the ten thousand yeah. dollars. So why do I expect that? I or know. you know, you look at the Kickstarter and you think one of two things: either that's an awful lot of money, or wow, that's really not very much money. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you look at the it, it, when when you get the the Kickstarters in those two extremes, you look at them and just go, um, are these people thinking? I mean, how much planning has gone into this? And Right. You know, am I actually going to get something at the end of things? Well, part of that's the fear, too, that these people are not... Um, a lot of people who do Kickstarters are the creators, right? That doesn't mean they necessarily are good at publishing right. and at selling, right? And those are very different jobs. Um, and having... I had the advantage of having been the publisher of Pinnacle, or the president of Pinnacle for a long time. So I had published many, many books before this, right? I knew roughly... I, know, I, I have all the skills I need for layout and uh, coding and all this kind of stuff and finding artwork and finding artists and knowing what general rates are for printing and things like that. And I have people in the industry, like the guys over at, uh, at Drive Through Fiction, Matt uh, McElroy over there, uh, as soon as he saw I was running a Kickstarter, I said, hey, we can help you fulfill those books. We'll make sure we do it for you at a good price. You know? and I'm like, well, because they know me, they actually come to me with these deals, right? Um, and it's not like they don't offer them to anybody else. So, hey, if you're playing something like this, guys, go check them out. They do a good job. Uh, and they, they've taken care of me very well. But uh, because you have those contacts, because you know what you're doing, you have a much better chance of succeeding, not just in raising the money, but actually delivering the product. Right? Um, and I often talk to people about how Kickstarter is what we call a trust economy. Right? 
uh, people need to, when they give you the money, they have to trust that you're actually going to be able to deliver this thing that you're promising them. And there's two ways you can do that. You either have a really good track record that shows that you know what you're doing already and you, you've proven yourself, or you need to just knock everybody's socks off of how polished and professional and fantastic you are, right? Um, I'm not that polished when I do the videos and such. That's not my great thing. I'm like, I, I'm mad. I got a book. I'd like to write. Can you help me out? And uh, But I, because I've got a track record, people can look at that and say, well, Matt's books I've read before. I can go read his other stuff right now. I believe that he's going to be able to produce these books. I've got, as of uh, this week, I've got 21 novels published, right? So people know that the books are out there. They can go and get a sample of my style. I offer free samples for people to actually check out if they just want to see, okay, am I going to like what this guy's talking about or not, right? Because I don't expect somebody to just say, oh, uh, here's your money. I mean, I'd like them to, I like to give them reasons to give me money. So. Although, you know, just giving the money is sometimes nice. You know, too. I'm not going to argue if they want to throw <coughs> cash at me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I don't depend on that, and people shouldn't depend on that. That shouldn't be your business model is betting that people are going to throw cash at you. Which, you know, is kind of scary. Is it, That's what it really comes across with some of these people is, uh, particularly the the one that I, the Kickstarter I was talking about, it was like just the the author just seemed to be, okay, you know, I'm, I'm so-and-so. I, I used to be famous. Um, give me your money. <laughs> exactly. Of course, that's sad. the I mean, author didn't use the phrase, I used to be famous, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's that undertext there. But yes. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad because you know I think what <coughs> is people think that Kickstarter is actually a uh, a great means of, of getting money in. Kickstarter is actually a rotten way to tell people about your product, right? Yeah. It is a great way for collecting pledges, and it's a great platform in which to stand to tell people about your product. But it, uh, in and of itself, just being on Kickstarter won't bring you anything, right? Yeah. You can go down Kickstarter on the on the new projects and see lots of them that don't have any money at all or have very little funding, right? And it's, not, it's because those people, when they put the product up, don't have any plan to actually tell anybody about it or get money in, right? They have no way of doing that. Um, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I've got a fan base and I've got some followers, so I can tell them, hey, guys, I'm doing this stuff, and they'll come over and at least check it out, and if they like it, they'll tell their friends. But if you don't have that, you need to actually then go develop that or figure out ways to get yourself out there to show people. It's, it's basic marketing, unfortunately. I mean, a lot of writers don't like to do this kind yeah. of stuff because... It requires you to be an extrovert. It requires you to tell people about your stuff. And a lot of people equate selling them their product with bragging, which are not the same thing, right? You should yeah. be enthusiastic about your product. But to tell people why you're excited about what you're working on is not meant to be climbing up and saying, hey, I'm so cool. It's just like, oh, I got this cool idea. You're really going to check it out. You know, Let your enthusiasm well, for what you're doing show through. Well, and fiction publishing has changed dramatically in you know just in the last decade, and oh, yeah. so many things that authors used to be able to you know depend on publishers and and the publishing houses and all that's you know for marketing and advertising and you know just, you know so many yeah. behind the scenes things just don't happen anymore. No, it's it's absolutely true unless you happen to be you know J.K. Rowling, Stephen King, etc. Uh, yeah, but even me. Stephen even Stephen King has to do some of his own marketing yes. nowadays. I mean, you know, w the, when the day comes that Stephen King has to like you know do his own marketing, you know something has changed in in publishing. Yeah, I mean, but mid listers and lower don't get book tours, don't get anything like that. They barely get ads, right? I mean, the, actually, the best thing that a publisher does for you is they put your book on a shelf in a bookstore where people can see it and they can buy it, right? Uh, and that's one thing as a self-publisher, when I'm doing these 12 for 12 books, I'm self-publishing. I don't get that. There's no way for me to really get my books onto a bookshelf store. No practical way, right? Technically, somebody can order my books and put them on a shelf from a, for a bookstore, right? But on a practical level, they're just not going to do that. And I understand that. I mean, they've, they've got you know the latest books from the big publishers that they want to sell that they've already placed orders for and are taking up shelf space. There's no reason for them to take a risk on self-published authors. Well, I've been telling my local bookstore what a what a great author you are and how they need to how they <laughs> need to, to stock more of your books. So. But you know what? Well, it, it was they funny order because they'll publish books. They'll order my books through Penguin and Delray and Wizards and Games Workshop. Yeah. Well, I I will I will. I'm okay with that too. I like yeah. to sell them all. So that's. Well, once I know that I can, I can, I can push for your self-published books through a bookstore. I, I will, I will get my bookstore to start ordering those as well. It was funny because, well, I told you, I uh, actually I just got the your your leverage novel last week. Yeah. And I went in and picked it up, and um, you know, I, I shop at a 
because you know I'm one of those hipster types. I shop at an independent <laughs> bookseller, and um, um, I go in. There, well, because we were talking online, and you said, "Oh, it's in the tie-in section." Uh, my bookstore doesn't have a tie-in section. <laughs> 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 but um, you know, I, I go in to pick it up, and and the um, the the person behind the counter is like, "Oh, what's this? This looks neat. I've seen that show." And it's, I'm and I, and I said, I, "I know the author, and he's a really nice guy. You should you should you should carry more stuff by him." <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. No problem. <laughs> but um, and then I guess we'll kind of we'll kind of wrap things up. The one last thing I did want to talk about before uh, we go. Um, because as you know, I'm a big fan of one of your novels. Um, because I, I did, I, you know, I, I blogged about it and and I've I've gushed about this book online a few times. And um, it is uh, your whoops, your novel through uh, Angry Robot. It is Matt Forbeck's Immortals. Ah, I thank you. Got a, quite a bit of uh, product placement on that one. Um, but this, uh, um. This I, I well I mean you know I've told you before but I, I just I love this book this is probably one of the best in my you know, opinion obviously one of the one of the better um, sort of contemporary cyberpunk books and um, really I think that this this holds up to a lot of like the the sort of the classics of the genre um, thank you you know um, I, I loved working on that book that was that one's very near and dear to my heart. Um, it was. It, I mean, it was a. Real, it had some. You know, there were some really neat ideas in it, and it had some stuff that really wasn't. Um, you know, addressed in a lot of that sort of in that genre in right. in the fiction. Um, and it was a very good read. Um, anyone can I, can who I tell you a secret. What's that? Uh, I've been I've been cleared to talk about this a little bit now. Oh, please please tell me there's going to be a sequel. Uh, not that, but we have option <sighs> for a film. Ooh, now that's kind of cool too. Yeah. Um, That's about all I can say about it right now. The, the guys who optioned it uh, are are fairly well known. Um, it's not Spielberg or Lucas, right? But it's uh, they're fairly well known. They've produced a number of good movies before, uh, and they want to be able to make the announcement to the trades themselves when they're ready for that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm pretty excited about the relationship. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's a phenomenal novel, and if if people uh, watching or listening to us, if if you like, you know, cyberpunk or science fiction with a um, you know, a, a sort of a modernish contemporary setting, rather than you know your space opera, your far future stuff. You really uh, should check check out Matt's novel, Immortals. Thank you. I I, can, I cannot really recommend it highly enough. And of course, I am like I said, I'm looking forward. I you you're the next book in the queue, and then you know the next thing that I'm going to read is of course your Leverage novel, The Con Job, which um, I I am also looking forward to. Um, to uh, to reading and living vicariously because um, I have uh, as of yet uh, not been able to go to Comic Con. Ah, because, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, you know, and when the, when when the badges when the badges sell out in like an hour and a half, the the yeah. odds of us normal folks getting to go is is uh, fairly slim at times. But one day, one day, I'll I'll get to go and uh, you know, and I'll get to yeah, I'll get free badges for pros, right? You have to prove you have a professional affiliation of some sort. Um, but they are free badges. Now that means you still got to get to San Diego, find out what's up, right. and all that kind of stuff. But, um, which yeah, is not easy either. Yeah. Well, considering because uh, I was looking into the the cost for going to Gen Con again this year, and yeah. cons considering what it costs for you know a hotel for four or five days in Indianapolis, I can imagine what it must cost for like a week in San Diego. Yeah, it's not cheap. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're you get a much bigger bang for your buck in, in Gen Con for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, let's wrap up. Um, where, uh, where are the best uh, ways, or the the Matt Forbeck approved um, uh, ways for people to reach you online? Oh, okay. Uh, before we do that, I got one thing oh. I wanted to mention to you too, yes. which we just started publicizing today. There's a, a bundle of eBooks coming out this week called the Bundle of Holding. So you, it's uh, a bunch of uh, ex game designers, essentially current game designers, even in some cases, uh, mostly role playing game guys. Um, who've gotten together and we're going to be doing a pay what you want bundle. Um, it's starting on Wednesday, and you go to uh, bundleofholding.com, and there's a countdown ticker going on right now. Uh, and then we'll reveal the books. One of, I have one of my books in there, uh, one of my self-published books, 
And the rest of them are all self-published as well. They come without any DRM or anything kind of stuff. And these are all e-books, right? What's that? They're all e-books, right? Yeah, they're all e-books, exactly. Um, But, you know, the Humble Bundle did one of these. There's a group called Story Bundle that does this as well. That's uh, something we're pushing pretty hard this week if people want to stop by and say it's going to run for about two or three weeks. Um, But it's going to be a hell of a deal, actually, for people to get in and uh, get some pretty damn good reading, actually. Uh, As far as myself... Uh, I'm at forbeck.com, F-O-R-B-E-C-K.com, and you can also find me on Twitter at m Forbeck, and I'm on Facebook at Forbeck. I'm on Google Plus at wherever the hell all the numbers are that go at the edge because they don't give you pretty uh, URLs for that yet. Um, but you can find me there. I'm on all the different social networks because I like doing this kind of stuff. Um, I like interacting with people. I'm stuck in a room by myself typing most of the day, so that's a chance for me. To yeah. Actually, the internet is my water cooler, as I like to say. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking uh, with me tonight, Matt. Of and uh, good luck on um, the the next Kickstarter. Um, let me know what uh, you're doing, and I'll be more than happy to help. You know, push it in my own little ways. So I appreciate it always. All right. Thank you very much, and and have a good night. All right, you too, Chris. Thanks.